A very good morning to you colleagues and we do apologize for that technical glitch at the beginning. On behalf of the Director General, Ministry of the Public Service, I welcome you to the second in the series of quarterly human resource webinars. This is a forum where we discuss human resource issues and the development of the human resources of the public service. Today's webinar is entitled Coping with Challenges, Strategies for Human Resource Practitioners. My name is Sheldine Santuali, Senior Human Resource Officer with the Learning and Development Directorate, and today I will be your moderator. This webinar is brought to you by the Learning and Development Directorate in collaboration with Underwood Talent Development Services, Inc. and facilitated by our guest presenter, Ambassador Joan Underwood, and she is the Managing Director and Principal Consultant. Today, Ambassador Underwood will turn the spotlight on the human resource landscape and the associated effects on the physical and emotional well being of workers, including human resource professionals themselves, and how the specialty area can best position itself to effectively address the peri and post pandemic realities. We'd really like to hear from you and we, of course, want to include your voice in the conversation. But before we get there, here are some rules of engagement that we want to share with you. We want to encourage you to mute your microphone, disable your video, pause and minimize distractions as much as possible, focus on the presentation, of course, reflect on your own experiences, we encourage your full participation and share what you have learned in the chat. And this helps us to achieve optimal benefit from our interaction by reducing feedback and increasing bandwidth. This session promises to be very interactive with time allotted for activities and a question and answer segment. You're going to be given the opportunity to use the chat box and share your comments. Our team will be monitoring the chat space to share your questions and comments with the facilitator. At this point, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Ambassador, Ambassador Joan Underwood. And Ambassador Joan H. Underwood holds a master's degree in health services administration from the George Washington University and an executive MBA from the Cave Hill School of Business, University of the West Indies. She's a senior management consultant and policy advisor with extensive experience in both the public and private sectors. Specific areas of expertise include the design and facilitation of training programs for public and private sector leaders, organizational behavior and management, human resource management, strategic planning and management, change management, corporate governance, public sector transformation, and executive and performance coaching. Professional designations held by Ms. Underwood include that of a senior professional in human resources from the US-based HR Certification Institute, the Society for Human Resource Management, Senior Certified Professional Accreditor, Accredited Director, and Credentialed Master Trainer. She also holds the designation of an Ericsson Professional Coach and is a member of the International Coaching Federation. Joan's most recent professional accomplishments include certification in strategic workforce planning and as a pro side change practitioner. Joan's commitment to lifelong learning is evident from the various executive development programs which she has completed at internationally acclaimed institutions, including Harvard, the Richard Ivey School of Business, University of Western Ontario, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Sloan School of Management, and the Association for T Talent Development. She has also served as a facilitator and a subject matter expert in the Cave Hill School of Business Executive Diploma in Management and the Executive MBA programs. Her relationship with the Cave Hill School of Business also includes serving as a facilitator and coach in their open enrollment and corporate leadership development programming. 
In addition to her work in coaching, management, and policy, Joan served for seven and a half years as Antigua and Barbuda's non-resident ambassador to a number of Latin American countries, including Mexico, Venezuela, Chile, and Brazil. Joan's leadership journey is featured in Championing Women Leaders as one of 27 case studies of outstanding women leaders in the Commonwealth. I will now invite Ambassador Underwood to begin to share her presentation with us. Ambassador Underwood. Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be among HR colleagues on this gray yet beautiful morning in Barbados. And so I'm just going to ask Sheldine to give me a verbal confirmation when she's able to see my screen. Yes, I can. Wonderful. So we have so much to talk about this morning that I'm going to jump right in. As you've heard from Sheldine, our focus this morning is coping with challenges, strategies for us as HR practitioners. Now, about 15 years ago, the biggest challenge confronting our profession was the perception by others within our respective organizations that we weren't sufficiently strategic. And this book, which was published back in 2005, featured that complaint as it expanded on the need for HR practitioners to be more strategic and business linked. Well, let's look at what has happened since then. Let's take the pulse of the current status of HR compared to what obtained 15 years ago in 2005. And we'll start with the good news. So according to an HR.com survey conducted in 2019, HR departments are now well aligned with strategic organizational goals. Some statistics to go along with that, 63% of the respondents in that survey said that there's a high or very high level of commitment between HR and organizational goals. If we extend that to include moderate alignment, the number jumps to over 90%. However, there was also some bad news to accompany that. And the bad news is, and I'm sure that many of you can relate to this, is that we're spending too much time on administrative work instead of high value collaboration. And if this is a pain point for you, go ahead and send us a signal either by a thumbs up or a comment in the chat box. But let's drill even deeper to see the extent of this problem. As you can see from the bar chart at the bottom of your screen, the vast majority of respondents have indicated that they spend over 40% of their time on administrative or back office duty. That's a lot. So there were only 28% of respondents who said that they spend less than 40% of their time on back office duties. Further to that, 82% of the survey respondents said that this quote unquote lost time spent on the back office and administrative functions could be spent better elsewhere. So that was the HR.com survey. My company also completed a survey to, to check on the status, not just of HR professionals, but Caribbean professionals in general. And I'd like to draw to your attention that this was a survey that was conducted in February. So this is before the pandemic was declared. And we asked individuals to self-assess in relation to their stress levels. And we provided them with a spectrum that ranged from feeling comfortable to feeling stretched to feeling stressed. And as you can see from the chart in front of you, 42% of respondents reported that they were stressed. And remember, this is before COVID. Can you imagine what the stats would look like if we were to repeat that survey today? In addition to the 42% of respondents who said that they were stressed, 37% said that they were stretched. Only one in five, that's 21%, one in five respondents self-described as being comfortable in their jobs at this point in time. That's back in February. 
that same survey, we also asked them on average, how many hours do you work within a given week? As you can see, about half of the respondents said that they were working between 40 and 50 hours a week. But then look at the number for between 50 and 60, almost a third of the sample. So that's 80% of respondents who are working anywhere between 40 and 60 hours a week. Another question inquired about sleep. So the question was, on average, how many, of, how many hours of sleep do you get on a weeknight? And we didn't ask them about weekends because again, that was pre-pandemic. So people might have been out fetting and so on. So we didn't ask them how much time they were sleeping on the weekend. But look at this, 58% of respondents reported that they were only getting between four and six hours of sleep nightly, four to six hours of sleep nightly. Another 36% said that they were getting between six and eight. So let's put this in context. Is this good? Is this bad? And so we have our first opinion poll. So this is an opinion. So there are no right or wrong answers. It's your opinion. Question is, what's the minimum number of hours of sleep you need in each night in order to function optimally? Note well, optimally. So we invite you to go ahead and weigh in on this opinion poll by selecting the option that matches with your opinion. Okay, I don't know if you can see the survey it was up for me and the, okay, so here we go. This is it. Minimum number of hours sleep that you need each night. So go ahead and jump in and select the option that you think works from your perspective. So the polling is going to end in just about, we have 70% of persons who have responded. Mm -hmm. So we're going to end in about five seconds. Great. And these are the poll results. Okay, so the votes are in. I am relieved to see that only 2% thought that you could function optionally on four hours of sleep. You are depriving yourself if that is your practice. All right, so we see we have a tie, 44% chose six hours as well as seven hours. And then we had a 10% weighing in saying that 10 hours is what is optimally required. So here's the answer. According to the Mayo Clinic, Adults need seven hours of sleep nightly in order to function optimally. Now, if we function on less than that, we run the risk of having decreased alertness, poor logical reasoning, poor concentration, and memory problems. And I strongly suspect that there's some of you on the line who are saying, man, I can function at six. Some may even be saying I can function at four. And I'm sure you're right. But the question is, how much sleep do you need to function optimally? So imagine if you could move from four to seven. Okay, you may say that's too big a leap. But imagine if you could move from four to six. How much more alert, effective, um, how better you, your memory would work if you were getting a bit more sleep? Okay, so let's recap the summary of pre-pandemic challenges. So while we had improved on the strategic alignment that existed in 2005, the majority of our time is spent on administrative duties as opposed to high value adding duties. 82% of the respondents in the hr.com survey stated that that time spent on the back office work could be better spent elsewhere. Coming closer to home, 42% of the UTDS pre-pandemic survey responses, respondents self-assessed as being stressed, 
while an additional 37% self-assessed as being stretched and only 21%, less than one in five, describe themselves as being comfortable. So at this point, I'm going to throw open the chat box. Are there any questions, Sheldon, that have come up that I need to address or any feedback, comments before we move on? There's nothing here at the moment. Okay, great. So we will proceed. So we've set the stage in terms of what was happening prior to. Then came March 11th, and I don't know if this date is as indelibly ingrained in your mind as it is in mine, but that is the day that the World Health Organization announced that COVID had become a global pandemic. And this little prayer has helped me to maintain my sanity since that date, the serenity prayer, because like so many other folks, my entire world shifted on its axis when that pandemic was declared. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and most importantly, the wisdom to know the difference. Because I tell you, stressing over things that you cannot change is a formula for disaster. All right, so what should HR practitioners be doing? And remember, keep our pre-COVID context in mind. We, along with other professionals, were already feeling stretched to stressed. We already weren't getting enough sleep. So the absolute first thing that we should be doing as HR practitioners is putting on our oxygen mask first. I know it's probably been a, quite a while since any of you have been on a plane, given that the airport has was closed for quite some time, but I'm sure you can remember that safety briefing while we're still on the ground, in the event of an emergency, put your oxygen mask on first. And we know why this is the case. We cannot take care of others unless and until we take care of ourselves. And we cannot delegate self-care to anyone else. So first and foremost, before we start thinking about the staff and what HR needs to do to take care of the staff, you and, and I as well, as HR practitioners, we need to take care of ourselves. So what you see before you is a list of 10 self-care strategies that I have utilized and I've found them to be particularly effective. This is not by any stretch of the imagination an exhaustive list. And so I encourage you to go ahead and type into the chat box strategies that work for you and which you could recommend to your colleagues and to the other um, employees that we serve within the public service. So the first one, exercise, get moving. And when we were on lockdown, this was particularly difficult because you know the gyms were closed, we were limited in terms of what we could do outside, but we can get creative. And thank God for the digital age that we live in with YouTube and so many opportunities that we can find online to get moving and moving includes dancing you know alone in your home if that's what you need to do to relieve some of the stress all right we already touched on sleep proper nutrition food is our body's fuel so imagine if you have a high value vehicle a luxury vehicle high performance vehicle and you put in cheap fuel in it what do you think is going to happen over time the performance of that vehicle is going to be compromised. All right, number four, express, express gratitude. Now, why is this on a list about self-care and relieving stress? Our bodies cannot be grateful and stressed at the same time. That's just how we're configured. The mere expression of gratitude um, leads to certain hormones being released, which are incompatible with stress hormones. So simply by expressing gratitude, we can take ourselves out of an area of stress into one of a more positive feeling. 
practicing mindfulness. What do I mean by this? It's so easy to get caught up worrying about what happened yesterday and what might happen tomorrow that we lose track of what's happening in the moment. And sometimes it's important to stop and savor the small successes, the small victories, just be present. Pay attention to what's happening here and now. Something else that can help us as we deal with stress is being creative, making or creating something. Um, my husband is an avid do-it-yourself person. So while we were on lockdown, he was building new shelves. He was, you know, fixing things up around the house. That's how he managed it. Um, some of us, we get creative in the kitchen and that's fine too. I'll just remind you of number three. So if we're gonna get creative in the kitchen and then have to consume our creativity, let's try and make it something healthy, okay? Number seven, engaging in positive imagery. Here's another um, brain science fact. Our minds cannot tell the difference between a lived experience and an imagined experience. So for example, if you picture yourself in a happy place, in your happy place, your body responds as if you are there. You can feel good the way you would feel if you were actually in your happy place. So if you can summon up those positive feelings at will, why not do so? Eight, um, we're not in lockdown anymore, but it's still important to remind ourselves that we are social beings, so we need to make those connections. So even as we observe and adhere to the social distancing protocols, remember to make connections with others. Number nine, now I want to, you know, disabuse anyone on the line who might be laboring under the myth that it's a sign of weakness to either ask for or accept support. It is not. And we as women, we're particularly vulnerable to this myth. We want to appear as superwomen. We want, we don't want to show any vulnerability. So we soldier through and try and do everything ourselves. Ladies, let's stop torturing ourselves unnecessarily. It's okay to ask for and accept support. And I'm coming to you men. Don't think that it's just the ladies who have this concern because we know that you guys want to feel you know hey i'm a guy i got this it's okay to ask for and accept support and number 10 just breathe the deep cleansing breaths can help to expel the stress from our bodies so I see the chat has been lighting up, Sheldon. So what's going on? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, our colleagues have shared some of your own tips, but just, just if I can go through a few casual reading, gardening, exercise, mindfulness, engaging in positive imagery, proper yes. nutrition, uh, listening to music came up a few times, uh, sharing with others. Someone shared they danced on their patio, walked yes. around their home 20 times and, and got a puppy. <laughs> ah, so those are some of the strategies. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So I see that you know you have coping strategies in your back pocket. Don't hesitate to take them out. You cannot pour from an empty cup. All right, so here we have a little knowledge poll because in addition to taking care of ourselves, we have to be mindful. We have to be paying attention to what's happening to staff. So here's a question. As an HR professional, which of the following combinations of strategies would be appropriate for you to suggest to workers to help them alleviate stress? So we're going to, Joey's going to go ahead and launch that poll and... Uh, this is a knowledge poll now, so we do have right and wrong answers in this one. I am curious to see what you will come up with.
We're currently at 60% voted, so we'll end at 75%. And the poll will end in five seconds. Wonderful. So we have a clear cut majority. 83% of you said what would be appropriate to it is to advise sleep, proper nutrition, being grateful and connecting with family. Uh, C had 11% of the vote, while D had 6%. So I can tell you that the majority is correct. It is, in fact, B. So let's talk about C and D. All right. And we were looking for the best possible answer. So in C, being mindful is good. Creating is, um, something is good. Asking for help is good. Watching TV. Don't know that you, um, as HR practitioners, we should be sending folks off to watch TV. Okay. D, take vacation, pray, stop worrying, try yoga. The one that rules this out as the best possible answer is stop worrying. That is not an appropriate response. We need to be more empathetic. So simply telling someone to stop worrying is not helpful to them. All right. So thank you so much for your participation in that. So let's delve in to some of the pandemic related challenges. So the ILO uh, published a report that indicated that the pandemic could reduce global working hours by nearly 7% in the second quarter of 2020. And they also indicated that 81% of the global workforce had been affected by the lockdown. McKinsey, that US-based um, consulting agency, they published a study indicating that up to one third of the global workforce was vulnerable to reduced income, furloughs, or layoffs as a result of the pandemic. And the number has probably gone up since McKinsey did that initial study. Coming closer to home now, we see that in Latin America and the Caribbean, 140 million workers was in the informal economy alone were said to be impacted by the pandemic. And what makes it even more challenging is that there's no definitive projection for when and I would add, if at all, we will be able to return to pre-pandemic business as usual in terms of the where and the how that we work. So while the public service here in Barbados has largely opened up and then most of you may be back in your offices, it's not the way things were prior to March 11th, I would, would hazard a guess. Um, the mask wearing, the social distancing that's, that's still in place, um, the hand sanitizing and all these additional safety measures that we have to take. It is not business as usual when we think about what obtained prior to the declaration of the pandemic. Additionally, the economic implications of extended quarantines include at least minimum possible loss of client base. And this is more for folks in the, the private sector, but it affects us in the public sector because with the tourism industry taking such a heavy, heavy hit, government revenues will be down. With the entertainment sector taking such a heavy hit, I mean, for, you know, for example, um, crop over had to be canceled. So for many in the private sector, they may find that their old business models were obsolete for you in the public sector, you may find that it will have implications for your operations because of the impact on the government coffers, as well as some of the operational changes that you need to make in order to exercise proper health and safety measures. So those are some of the pandemic related changes. So remember, we're about how do we deal with these challenges? So so how can nature add value in the face of these challenges? And I love this quotation from Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor of the, um, the Holocaust. 
And he indicated that when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And that's really profound. Right? So how can we change ourselves or our behavior to more effectively navigate the situation in which we find ourselves. So I've come up with a proposed four step strategy and a four point action agenda for us as HR practitioners. So I'll take you through each of the four steps and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation about it. All right, so step one, take a seat at the table with strategic business partners to help reimagine the business model. No, I was privileged, I think it was last week, to attend a webinar where the Learning and Development Director presented a case study of their migration of their training programs to an online forum. That's a classic example of them taking a seat at the table to drive the reimagination of the business model. No, as um, Faye reported it, it had been in the works, but the timeline had to be accelerated because of the pandemic and the impact that it had on our ability to have face-to-face -face meetings. So that's step one, ensure that you as HR are at the table to reimagine how you do business. Step two, and I hope nobody from BDF is on the line to hear me encouraging a riot, but that's a exactly what I think we should be doing as HR practitioners. We need to start a riot. And of course, it's an acronym. So I'll take you now through what this disruptive acronym means. So we need to engage in critical analysis to determine what products, what services, and what functions should be retained. There are certain things that we're going to have to continue to do essentially more or less as we did them prior to to the pandemic being declined, declared. So that's those things that would be retained. Next, some items, some products, some services, some functions should be improved or innovated. And what I'd like to suggest to you as a tool to help you to navigate the improve or innovate space is job crafting. And I absolutely get it that within the public service, there's certain limitations in the extent to which we can allow staff to participate in job crafting. But this is not business as usual, folks. So we have to start thinking creatively. We have to start innovative so that within the constraints of the civil service orders and the other legal and regulatory frameworks within which we operate, how can we adjust jobs so that people are able to remain on board, to work from home if necessary, and to take into consideration this new reality that's confronting us. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about job crafting and its relevance for you in the public service in the chat box and when we open up a, a, in a little bit. All right, so the I in Riot is for improved or innovative. The O is for outsourced. So there's certain things that we may still need to benefit from that function or service, but a determined may be made that, you know, we can outsource that. We can have someone else take care of that so that we can focus on other things. All right. And the outsourcing, for example, I know it's been on the agenda as part of the public sector modernization initiative that the government has been spearheading. And the final letter in our riot acronym is the T or terminated. And folks, this is just the reality that's confronting us. In some instances, some roles and functions may disappear, all right? And we need to do this in a very mindful, a very analytical way rather than, you know, in, in a very reactive way. So that's step two, start a riot. Step one, take a seat at the table, help to reimagine the business. Step two, start a riot. Step three, you know, three-part action plan, 
relates to strategic workforce planning. And if you think about what we did in step one and what we did in step two, this will have implication about the staff complements that we need, both quantitatively and qualitatively in terms of the types of skills that we're going to need in order to move forward. So in this third step of our HR action agenda, we will engage in workforce planning by designating job roles as mission critical or strategic, core, supportive, or even obsolete. So what do these terms mean? So a mission critical or strategic position is essential to the mandate of the ministry department or agency. This is why you are there, is to execute this specific purpose or mission. Core job functions now have to do with, they're not at the level of mission critical, but they also feed into and support the core mandate of the ministry department or agency. The supportive roles would be things such as HR, the accounting services, those roles which are there that don't directly feed the mission, but which are essential if the MDA is to execute its function. And then based on our reimagination of the, the business, based on having you know, led the riot, we may find that some positions are obsolete in that they no longer contribute to the mission or to supporting the attainment of that mission. So that's step three in our four-part action plan. And step four is a reminder that it's not business as usual. So how does HR need to show up now and going forward? We absolutely need to be agile. All right. Gone are the days where we can say that and I, I know Femery can relate to this. We set our action agenda, and this is how we're pushing through, and we have it in the, 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 the strategic plan, so that's what we're doing. No, because no one predicted COVID. Well, I mean, no one within our context predicted it. So we cannot be obdurate and, and insist that we're implementing the plan that we had before. I already mentioned how I learned in the case study how the directorate pivoted in order to fast track the transition to an online platform for its learning. So HR practitioners, all of us in our respective spaces have to be agile enough that we can pivot when the changes in the external or internal environment dictate that we need to do that. And what does that mean? We have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that will challenge some of us to the core, especially those of us who are used to being in control, used to having a plan and working our plan. The reality is right now what's important is agility. We also need to be able to justify financially every single initiative that we are championing because we know that the budget is going to take a hit. So we have to be able to distinguish between what's absolutely necessary and what would be nice to have. So some of the nice to have stuff has to go on the back burner for the time being, given the current realities. And a reminder, let's not lose the gains that we made, you know, between 2005 and now. We have to ensure that we continue to align to the new strategic business objectives. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that's our four point action plan for HR practitioners. So gonna check to see how that landed with you with a knowledge poll. Which one of the following terms is not one of the job categories utilized in strategic workforce planning? So your options are A, strategic, B, obsolete, C, tactical, and D, support. As they say on Sesame Street, one of these things just doesn't belong here. So please go ahead and weigh in on this poll.
Okay, only 47% of participants have responded so far. Oh, this one is <laughs> challenging you. <laughs> Seem to be stalled at 52%. All right, let's, we don't need to torture folks. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I said that and it jumped up to 55. Go ahead and guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you um, have a 25% chance of being right. Yeah, so <laughs> we're at 55%. I'll end the polling now and share the results. <laughs> okay, so the majority, 59% selected obsolete. 41% selected tactical. This time, the minority perspective is the right one. It's tactical. Yes, there will be some positions that will be obsolete because remember we said that there's some functions that we would terminate. So then there would be positions that would become obsolete. Tactical just never got mentioned at all during the discussion. All right. Right? So you have mission critical, strategic, you have core, you have support, and you have obsolete job roles. Those are the four categories that we identified. All right, so let's open up the, the oh, one more, I forgot, I had another one. The acronym RIOT utilized in this presentation as part of the proposed HR action agenda stands for, is it retrench, innovate, outsource, and transfer? Or maybe it's retain, innovate, outsource, and terminate. Or retrench, improve, outsource, and telecommute. Or D, retain, improve, outsource, and telecommute. So, Joe, let's see what they have to say. Okay, we're at 56%. Okay, so they're more into the riot than they were into the four-point plan. <laughs> so it seems to have stalled at 66%. Okay. So we'll end the polling now and share the results. All right. So, with a whopping 87% of respondents, we have B, retain, innovate, outsource, and terminate. And the only other one that got some votes at 13% was retain, improve, outsource, and telecommute. So, oops. The answer is B, so the majority is right. And for those who chose D, while telecommuting obviously is a solution that has been implemented. Uh, the question was about what was utilized in the presentation. So I actually was careful not to mention telecommuting prior to this knowledge poll. So there you are. The majority was able to land on the correct answer. So we're going to open up for some discussion now. So here you have before you the entire four-point action plan. And what I'd love to hear from you is a sense of how relevant do you think this is to you in your given environment? And what additional action items do you think would help in terms of your response to the challenges associated with the pandemic. So the chat is open and we really invite you to weigh in on this so that we can have a lively discussion.
So, so for we encourage example, persons to go on and place their comments in the chat. <laughs> yes. And this feedback is based on your individual reality. So for example, is it practicable for you to participate in the reimagination of the business within your ministry department or agency? What might that require? Or what might be some obstacles that you would have to overcome in order to be able to do that? Okay, perhaps you've already started to engage in some strategic workforce planning. Where are your, um, the various roles in your MDA showing up? Are you concerned that there are many that may become obsolete given this new normal that is now being defined? And how agile is your current role? And let me make it even more personal. How agile are you? So to get the ball rolling, I am actually going to ask our hosts to share with us. Oh, I just saw the chat light up. So what do we have, Sheldon? I am seeing uh, from Faye Marie that the HR action agenda is so relevant and timely. I want to recommend us to insist on taking a seat at the business table. Uh, someone is suggesting cross training should be done. And, and someone else is saying and to, say, to start a riot. <laughs> That's from Faye. Simply start a riot. Okay, so I love the comment about cross training. Absolutely. And remember when I spoke about um, improve, innovate, I touched on job crafting. And you see, that's how we can leverage the cross training there. So instead of just focusing on what used to be on your job description before, how can we recreate? How can we recraft those jobs and build, you know, skills horizontally or, you know, what can we do in order to get more out of our organizations during this difficult time? So great feedback. Thank you so very much. All right. I see we have some more comments coming in. I'm seeing HR should also be flexible because of, const because of a constant changing work environment. Yes. That's so uh, agility there. Yep. And a, a comment from one of our colleagues here at LDD that we've obviously had to reimagine converting face-to-face -to, -face to virtual training. Uh, we have to be agile in order to get things working seamlessly in a short space of time. Absolutely. And I want to, you know, really commend LDD because I was so impressed with that case study because in a relative, because this, this is a process that could take, you know, a whole year to do this type of transition and to, to hear how you guys were able to fast track your plans and the agility came through in the telling of that story. Because the thing with agility, your goal is not to get it right the first time. Your goal is to move, be flexible, adjust as you go along. Mm -hmm. And again, this may be a hard skill to master, but it is absolutely imperative that we mm -hmm. do so. And one of us is also seeking a response to how do you use your riot uh, in the absence of support by senior management? Okay, so yes. So here's the thing. There's a, a tool that I use a lot that I, I'm going to invite you to visualize it now. And I hope nobody's going to have flashbacks to math class in school. But imagine three circles nested one inside the other. You know, they refer to them as concentric circles. But, you know, three circles, you know, one inside the other. Okay. Now, the largest circle, the outermost circle, that is your circle of concern. So that circle contains all the things in the world that you think about, you're concerned about, all right? Everything from climate change to whether the next hurricane going to hit here to whether the price of gas is going to go up or down, all right? Those are in your circle of control. But the thing is, you don't have control. Those are your circle of concern, sorry. You don't control those things. The next circle in is your circle of influence. 
So this is a subset of your circle of concern. There are things that you con you're concerned about that you have some level of influence over them, right? That's your circle of influence. And the smallest circle now, the one in the middle, that's your circle of control. So these are things that concern you, but in addition to them concerning you, you have control over what happens. So notice that's the smallest circle. So I ask you, where do you spend most of your time? Because here's the thing, we started out talking about stress. If you're spending most of your time in your circle of concern, that's where stress grows. In order for us to reduce our stress levels, we need to learn to focus on our circles of concern and our circles of influence. And when we spend more time in those two circles, they actually become bigger. So to come back to the original question now, in terms of you don't have the support, the thing is, how can you move that from a concern to something over which you have influence? And the first thing I would advise you to do is to look around the organization and see who else has a vested interest in what it is you would like to accomplish. Then having identified those persons, you need to cultivate alliances or networks with them so that they too can become advocates. And to initiate that conversation, you have to be able to answer the what's in it for me question for them. So you're not going to them to request that they help you, but you're going to them to have a conversation about how what you're proposing can help their agenda. And in that way, you're using your influence in order to have impact, okay? Then look again and see, okay, what is it that I actually already have control of that I can do that would show up as a bright spot so that it could then influence others to come on board? So again, rather than staying out in the circle of concern, focus on your circle of influence and your circle of control to try and expand them and ultimately have the impact that you're looking for. So I hope that response was helpful to the person who, who placed the question. Thank you, Ambassador. And we have uh, some other supporting comments. One of us is sharing that they like the support strategy, showing compassion really goes a long way and yes. it also helps with motivation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I, I'd like to mention, I'm going to take some liberty with my friends at LDD, that I'm in the process of publishing a book. And one of the things, and the book targets um, new or aspiring managers and leaders. And it focuses on the th what I perceive, given my years of experience, to be the three most common challenges that persons making the transition from in individual contributor to a leader or manager have to navigate. And the first one is managing self, then it comes managing others. And in terms of managing others, building relationships is so critical. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is the importance of empathy and in seeking to understand others before we try to get them to understand us. And so as you seek to build alliances, it's important if for you to answer the what's in it for me question for other people, you have to be curious, you have to ask questions to understand what are their pain points, what are their pressure points. And once you understand that, to try and craft your conversation in a way that will show that it will, the response you're soliciting will help to alleviate their pain points as well. And we will definitely look out for your book. That sounds like it's going to be a wealth of information that will give us some support in our practice as HR professionals. Absolutely. And I, I have yet another comment for you. Uh, I really believe that the acronym right is very relevant and practical for this time. and would assist us in really taking that seat at the table to reimagine our business model. Great. But again, you know, don't have... Um, BDF or the police force come looking for me <laughs> that I have been encouraging public sector people to start rioting, okay? <laughs> There's also another suggestion. Uh, 
put people in the areas that they're best suited, even if it's yes. finding out where staff will like to work within the organization. Beautiful. And that again falls on the job crafting to involve employees in designing the work that they will do. Great. All right. So I'm watching the clock. Um, could we take a few additional comments and then we'll have some time at the end for more discussions. But I have another little piece that I would like to share with you. So anything else or can I move on? I am seeing, uh, ah, someone is saying thank you for your answer. Uh, so you would have addressed their query Great. earlier. And uh, someone is seeking an explanation on a source due to the HR professional justifying finance. And there's also an additional comment um, where the suggestion is being made that we can learn from each other's riots as well. Okay. So in terms of the outsource, let me give you a, a very practical um, example. So in the era of COVID, um, disinfecting and sanitizing our physical space is really important. Now, in some organizations, and I'm not saying this is a universal solution, in some organizations, depending on the size of the space and your staff complement, you may decide, listen, this is not in our wheel well. We, we don't have the competency to do this. We don't have the material or other resources to do this. Let's outsource that function to, you know, some private sector or other entity that that is their core competency. So they already have the equipment, the materials, and the, the skill set and the knowledge in terms of how exactly do we do this effectively and efficiently. So that would be one example of things that you may decide to outsource, the cleaning of your building. All right, thank you so much. I'm not seeing additional comments at the moment. Okay. But we'll keep our eyes out for those. Great. And I like this next section that we're coming up to. I hope you're going to have some fun with it as I did. All right. So preparing for the future. And if you notice, you know, our crystal ball is buffering because we, it's not working. We cannot predict what's going to happen. All right. What's happening is what we call VUCA. And as you can see from the slide, the acronym stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Now, in management, we've taken this acronym actually from the military. It was soldiers who came up with this. And so imagine, this is, they used to use this to refer to, you know, hostile territory. This is what they would describe a wartime environment as being volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But guess what? This is no the business environment within which we operate. So there's turbulence ahead. Are we ready to navigate it? And so I have a series of interactive activities here. So BAU stands for business as usual. So there's a difference in terms of how we show up as HR practitioners and leaders in general in a business as usual environment versus a VUCA environment. So here's the question. Do you wait for additional information in a VUCA environment or do you act with a sense of urgency? So Joy, I can't remember if we decided to go for a poll. Yes, we did. All right. So which option do you think is more suited for a VUCA environment? have just about 50% weighing in. Okay, so as we monitor the clock, we may close down these polls a little quicker than Perfect. the others because okay. I, I, I don't want to wear out my welcome with LDD at all. <laughs> okay, it's at 60%. <laughs> so I'll end polling now and share the results. Okay, so the vast majority 
indicated that in a VUCA environment, we need to act with a sense of urgency. Uh, the remaining 15% went with the other option, which is waiting for additional information. So actually in VUCA, we need a sense of urgency. And remember the context I told you where VUCA came from, and this was in a wartime situation. Sometimes we just don't have the luxury of waiting for additional information. There will be uncertainty. That's the U in VUCA. All right. Typically, we would want to stay, do some more analysis, do some more search. But in a VUCA context, we have to resist that temptation and we need to use the information that we have. We cannot fall prey to the paralysis of excessive analysis here. Right. Remember, we spoke about agility. OK, we got to move do the best that we can with the information we have. And then when we get new information, if we need to change, we'll change. OK. So sense of urgency is important in a VUCA environment. All right, here's a second option. So Joe, if you could go ahead and launch that poll. So in managing in a VUCA environment, do you stay the course once you've made a decision or do you engage in constant updating? What say you? Okay, voting is at 61%. So I'll close the voting now and share the results. Okay, and comparable results to the last time. 83% weighing in says you have to engage in constant updating. And once again, you are right. No. Um, some folks said that you should stay the course. All right, so let, let's look at a, an example from right here in Barbados. So in this VUCA environment, if you notice, our prime minister has been constantly updating us as the situation evolves. And she has this expression that we have um, gas and brakes, I think she, she calls it. Anyway, and she says she's willing to use both pedals. So in a VUCA environment, we have to learn quickly as events unfold and new information comes to light. So the, the PM and, and the other um, members of the, the political directorate, they've listened to the expert advisors, the medical practitioners and others, the, and they seek diverse opinions. So the consultations that they've had with other stakeholders, and then they arrive at decisions. No, if some new information comes to, to light, then there's a change in decision. There was a time when the wearing of, of masks wasn't deemed compulsory, but based on new information, we got to that point. All right, so constant updating is important in a VUCA environment. All right, I think I have two more of these. So do we downplay the threat and withhold bad news or do we communicate with transparency? share the good as well as the bad news. We're at 69% Whoa. voted. Okay. So I think there. Okay. So we have firm opinions on this one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So at 75% voting, I'll end the polling now and share the results. Oh, 100% communicating with transparency. So clearly you got that one nailed. All right, so my exemplar in this one is Governor Cuomo. So if you remember back when New York was the epicenter within the US for the pandemic, his press um, briefings, he communicated with transparency. He was honest and accurate. He was clear about what he knew and what he didn't know. He told you what he anticipated and what was likely to happen if the anticipated circumstances materialized. At the same time, in each and every press conference, he infused hope. He kept saying, you know, we can do this, New York. We can do this. So he didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't hide the truth. At the same time, he held out hope. 
So he communicated with transparency as opposed to withholding bad news and don't playing the threat that the pandemic represented. All right, one more. So in a VUCA environment, do you double down to explain your actions or do you take responsibility and focus on solving problems? Okay, and I see the chat is lighting up as well. So we'll be able to go back in to uh, open up the discussion once we get through with these. Okay, we are at 44%. So it seems to have stalled at 56%. Okay, it's going up again. So it's currently at 66 and I'll end the polling now. Okay, great. All right, so almost unanimous. 98% say that you should take responsibility and focus on solving problems. We have 2% of respondents saying that you should double down. So the majority is right. And here's an example of what not to do. So what we've observed with President Trump is not best practice. If you do, because it's inevitable in a VUCA environment that some of the things aren't going to land exactly right. So remember when we first had the lockdown and they were allowing people to go to the grocery store <clears throat> in order to do some shopping. Um, initially, there was some confusion as, you know, the volumes of, you know, of shoppers was a bit overwhelming. So what happened, the government recalibrated and then they came out, they listened to advice and they came back with the system where we would go um, based on our surnames. So they have the alphabetical order thing. All right, so they acknowledged, didn't quite land the way we needed it to have listened to your feedback. Here we go. We took responsibility, we fixed it. Let's move on, let's try this one. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. So in contrast, no, the doubling down so this is, you know, up to today or yesterday, still retweeting things about not wearing masks, still, you know, promoting the use of drugs that, you know, can naturally be harmful. So again, in terms of what's the appropriate response in a VUCA environment, take responsibility, focus on problem solving problems. If you find you've made a, a misstep, recalibrate and move on. All right, so thank you for participating in those. We are just in the final moments of our time together this morning. So I just want to leave with you two essential coping competencies for us as HR practitioners. And that we've touched on, on these before, but I want to make this the final word in terms of leaving this with you. Adaptability. We have to be able to adjust to new conditions. All right, we need to be able to modify as opposed to being married to business as usual. It cannot work in a VUCA environment. Okay, resilience. That refers to the capacity to prepare for disruptions, to recover from shocks and stresses, and to adapt and grow from a disruptive experience such as we're all experiencing right now. And I want to flag a difference between the definition of resilience that I embrace and another one that can be quite common. And some people refer to resilience as the ability to bounce back. And the reason that I resist that definition, folks, there's no going back. We cannot go back, we have to move forward. We have to define the new normal, we have to innovate, we have to have that riot, and we need to be willing to adapt and grow, grow to fit the new situation rather than trying to get back to the old. And that's my time coming in just underneath the, the buzzer, I think. So do we have time for some more discussion or, or is our time all gone? <laughs> I, or, or the time is actually with us. I'm seeing comments in the chat uh, as it relates to the availability of our session this morning. And the short answer is yes, it will be available to you participants. <laughs> 
I'm seeing that we have some time. So if there are any other questions and comments, we welcome them in the chat. So feel free to go ahead. We invite them in. Okay. And even if you have questions about something that I didn't cover that you think should have been covered, I'm open to receiving those as well. Thank you, S. Ellis. I'm glad that you found the presentation helpful. And I see we have a question. What do we do with persons who seem comfortable in the before and can seem to adapt or, or rather do not seem to want to adapt? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Change is something that as human beings, there's an innate um, inclination to, to resist change. So my answer to this question, Jeanette, would be related to the importance of change management and change readiness. And I mentioned the book before, and one of the chapters in my book is about becoming more change able. And I love the ADCAR model of change. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, the, another acronym, the A stands for awareness, the D for desire, the K for knowledge, the next A is for ability, and the R is for reinforcement. So, and the thing with the ADCAR model is that it's kind of sequential. So in order to stimulate the desire for change, you need to first create the awareness, the why of the change. And if you're not familiar with the work of Simon Sinek, I mean, he does some fantastic work in terms of the importance of a compelling why. All right. So it's important for those folks who are not willing to adapt to help them to understand the why of the imperative for change. And sometimes people think that the choice is stay the same or change. Well, the same is not an option because it's disappearing. So in creating the awareness, sometimes we have to point out what will be the consequences of failing to change. So there highlighting the consequences and the accountability piece in relation to the change imperative would be important. And I'm seeing Ambassador Underwoods, uh, we have a query about your book and, and when will it be available to us is the question. Okay, so here's the story with the book. So remember what I said, but if you can't change the circumstances, change yourself. I wrote that book during lockdown. So I had started it as a project some time ago and got busy with life and you know my, my other consulting duties and so on. And when all my work dried up overnight <laughs> with the lockdown, <laughs> I decided, hey, that's what I'll do. I'll dust off that book and finish it. So why am I saying all that is because I'm very big into symbolism, right? So the pandemic was declared on March 11th. I have set myself a target of having my book launch on December 11th, which is nine months, because um, that's a gestation period. So, <laughs> so that's the target for having the book available. I'm looking to, to launch my book on December 11th. And thank you for the interest. And I'll be sure to, to share information with LDD. And you can also follow me um, in my, either on Facebook or, or check my website, Underwood Talent Development Services, for updates on that. And we're certainly looking forward to it. And I'm noting a word from the director. You have set a high standard for us to follow. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's and high on... praise coming from <laughs> Fayori Brown. Thank you very much, director. <laughs> and on that note, Ambassador Underwood, I'm going to Thank you so much for such an enlightening and engaging presentation. And I know as HR practitioners, we are already beginning to think about our approaches to managing ourselves uh, in this new environment and how best it can be achieved. We know for sure that four hours of sleep is not good. 
<laughs> are reminded that we've got to put our oxygen masks on. We keep talking about, uh, you know, not pouring from an empty cup. Um, so we need to remember those strategies that work for us. We, you took us through how HR can add value and the proposed new HR action agenda and how we need to review our roles, those roles we take on in the redefinition of a new HR model. And finally, you left us the reminder about the importance of, of, of adaptability and resilience uh, in these times. I'm just going to begin to share my screen awesome. so as we move towards wrap up thank you yes and we've come to the end of our sessions colleagues and this is all the time we have for our webinar today and again i want to thank you ambassador underwood it's really been a pleasure and so on behalf of all the team here at the Learning and Development Directorate, we want to thank you for this intervention at this critical time. And to you, the participants, of course, we appreciate your participation, your interaction, and we encourage you to reach out to your colleagues by sharing some of the information that's been imparted to you today. I also want to thank our production team here at LDD. I want to encourage you to look out for the follow-up email, which will contain a copy of today's recording of the webinar and a PDF of the slide so that you can review any information that you would have missed. We also invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to review recent webinars and to be updated on any new content that's been posted. So on behalf of the Director General, as well as the team here at the Learning and Development Directorate, thank you for joining us. I'm Sheldine Santfali. Have a great day and goodbye for now.